your own intelligence community has assessed that the Afghan government will likely collapse. That is not true. The first big city to fall was Kunduz, one after another. Afghanistan's biggest cities outside of Kabul were captured, Herat to the west. Terrorists in Kabul carrying out the deadliest attack on U.S. troops in over a decade. Afghanistan is lost. Freedom came under attack. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes. At my direction, a small team of Americans carried out the operation with extraordinary courage. They killed Osama bin Laden. Al-Baghdadi is dead. It's time to end America's longest war. We'll do it responsibly. Rushing to the airport, behind them, the sound of gunfire. Deliberately. Countless Afghans who helped American troops were left behind. In safety. Afghans by the thousands desperate to escape life under the Taliban. I have the honor of speaking with former Congresswoman, presidential candidate, and current Lieutenant Colonel in the U.S. Army, Tulsi Gabbard. Gabbard represented her home state of Hawaii for eight years on the Foreign Affairs, Armed Services, and Homeland Security Committees. Representative Gabbard began her life of public service at the age of 21 with a successful run for the Hawaii State Legislature. Two years later, she declined to run again, choosing to volunteer for military service in Iraq. As a soldier, she served tours in Kuwait, in Iraq, and remains active in the U.S. Army Reserves working as a civil affairs officer, and just recently returned from a deployment to Africa on a special forces mission to track down Al-Qaeda-affiliated jihadists. We are joined today by Tulsi Gabbard, who is beyond many things, a war veteran with deployments to the Middle East and Africa, and presently serves as Lieutenant Colonel in the US Army Reserves, which I think a lot of people don't maybe know that you're actively uh, involved and maybe they found out in the last few weeks because of some of your social media posts of what you've been up to and we'll get to that for sure. Uh, you continue though to serve our country. You voiced your support for the withdrawal in Afghanistan, something that I think a lot of people did was 80% of the country said they were for the withdrawal in Afghanistan. But you've also voiced your disapprovement with the way things went in Afghanistan and the withdrawal. So I just wanted to uh, get your thoughts on, let's just start there. I guess what went wrong from your point of view as not only someone who's served in the military, but also served in politics? Uh, well, thank you, Logan. It's great to talk to you. Um, in order to answer that question about what went wrong, I think it's important to, to really take a step back because we're talking about something that has been going on here uh, for the last 20 years uh, in Afghanistan that was really instigated, that began with the Islamist jihadist attack and declaration of war against our country on 9-11. Like so many people, that, that day changed my life. And it's really what was the determining factor for me personally to make a decision to enlist in the military, to take on this commitment with my life, to defeat those who threaten our country, to defend the American people against this Islamist jihadist threat. Now, this is a commitment that I've never forgotten. This is an enemy that continues to wage war against us today. But unfortunately, when we look to the leaders of our country, initially we went to Afghanistan, our special operations forces were sent there to go after and defeat Al Qaeda, which they did effectively and decisively and quickly. And instead of staying focused on that mission of both militarily and ideologically defeating this Islamist jihadist threat and terrorist groups like Al Qaeda and so on, our leaders got distracted and they set us on this other path towards uh, overthrowing secular dictators and follow on nation building missions. And we've seen this in Iraq, we've seen this in Libya, we've seen this in Syria, and we've seen this happen over successive Democrat and Republican administrations. Now this has come at a great cost to us, the American people. The results and the consequences of this is uh, Al Qaeda is stronger today than they were before they attacked us on 9-11. We've seen countless lives lost, American lives and the lives of people in these countries, trillions of American taxpayer dollars spent. We've seen how uh, Christians and religious minorities in many of these countries who were previously protected 
uh, have either been killed or driven out because of this Islamist jihadist threat. Uh, and the list goes on and on. Uh, what we've seen play out in Afghanistan recently is the latest consequence of failed leadership. As someone who was uh, involved in, in the war, and really, you know, we brought this up uh, with a lot of our guests, but for you and for me, we were roughly similar age. We were brought up with 9-11 really as sort of the backdrop to our young adulthood. It was, like you said, it's what motivated you to serve. And you brought up the fact that you're not so sure we're in a better place now. And I think that's hard for people to hear. I think that's hard for people who who lived through 20 years of this war, who again, for, for people of our generation, who it, it, it's very, it's a very stark moment of what happened before that, the nostalgia in the 90s, and then now post 9-11 to say, well, was any of this uh, worth it? If, you, if you're here saying, you know, we, you don't think necessarily we're in a better place. Is that something that can be even changed then? And I know that's a little off topic, but I'm just curious your thoughts on that. It just struck me as something that's, that it's a bit hard to deal with uh, as the normal American. Uh, of course, it, it has to change. It has to change and it changes with leadership. It changes with the kind of leaders who respect and trust the American people, who are honest with the American people, and who most importantly put the interests of the American people in our country uh, first, put country before party, put service above self. And unfortunately, over time, this is something that we have not seen happen for a whole host of reasons. But ultimately, coming down to, the, to that basic reality, whether it's partisan politics, desire for power, or you know, continuing to wage these wars that are counterproductive, that do not make us more safe to serve the interests of the military industrial complex, or because you have leaders who are not willing to admit, hey, we were wrong, we screwed up, and we're gonna get us back on track uh, as as a country, sure. is that ultimately what it comes down to is having that kind of leadership that the American people and our servicemen and women deserve. Yeah, and you bring up partisan politics. I think that has become a, a major issue. You have seen some uniting in a weird way against some of the imagery we've seen in Afghanistan. Uh, the American people are compassionate people. You've brought this up. I've discussed this as well, which is beyond Republican, Democrat, red or blue. There is a want to unite, but this time, unlike after 9-11, where people like you, you know, decide you're going to serve, there was almost a uniting, even from the conservative news and from the liberal news, from, from red and blue media, if you will, saying the images coming out of Afghanistan and this uh, horrifying ending uh, is something we can't live with as a, as in a society. Yeah, you know, as you said, uh, Logan, I and, and so many others understood that this withdrawal from Afghanistan needed to happen. Frankly, it should have happened a long time ago. We should never have embarked on uh, this attempt to build a mini America in Afghanistan. That effort was destined to fail from the outset. However, the way that this withdrawal was carried out was an abject failure and a tragic, tragic uh, disaster. Uh, and that that's really that's really the, the case here in, in understanding that um, there's there's a few different things that we're looking at. Uh, we were never going to stay in Afghanistan forever. This withdrawal needed to happen. Unfortunately, our leadership did not listen to the commanders on the ground who months, months before the withdrawal actually occurred and the evacuation operation occurred, uh, were warning about what would eventually happen, the failure of the Afghan government, uh, that this uh, evacu massive evacuation of civilians would need to occur. They saw that this is what would happen and unfortunately, leaders at the very top either ignored them or didn't even pay attention to what was really going on, which could have, which could have prevented the kind of tragedy that we saw play out that ultimately resulted in the loss of 13 American service members' lives and many Afghans. Yeah, hundreds. And you brought up whether this was inevitable. Was this ending inevitable? From your point of view, it seems like what you're saying is in the way the mission's been held the last 10 years, yeah, it may have been somewhat inevitable, but 10 years ago plus we should have been we should have been out and done with this long ago long ago again when you look at the the reality of what has happened in afghanistan specifically we can look to some similar examples in other countries when we the united states and, and with the military go in and you know overthrow a, a, sec, a secular dictator or try to uh, build a mini america 
uh, it, it doesn't work and unfortunately ends up being counterproductive, even with the best of intentions. As you said, the American people are compassionate people. We want to help. We want to be able to protect those who are suffering. But there is a there is a reality there that when we look at our track record, ultimately, we have seen time and time again how those efforts have resulted in more suffering and more problems in both the short and long term for the people uh, in these countries. With Afghanistan, what we've seen is the American taxpayer, uh, our government, essentially propping up a corrupt house of cards government uh, in Afghanistan. It was not sustainable by any means. Uh, the, the support to the military that we were sending them were, were, were basically set that, them up for failure there, making them wholly dependent on you know, American contractors feeding into the military industrial complex so that they would never really be in a place where they could be self-sustainable. There's so many different examples of this that, that we can point to over the last 20 years uh, that maybe people weren't aware of until the Afghanistan papers were revealed, where we had leaders in the Pentagon and, and Department of State and in our government, the highest level saying, wait, hold on a second, what are we doing there? What's our goal? What's our objective? So when you look at these things, and, and I, you know, there's a lot to look at here, but when you look at them, we can then start to understand how quickly this government and military failed. Uh, and our leaders have no excuse they cannot sit there and say, well, we had no idea this was gonna happen. All you have to do is look at how we got here. When I look at this though, you had 20 years of freedom for a lot of people or relative freedom. You had uh, you know, women and children and religious minorities having at least some form of uh, you know, decent lives. And now the US has to lead knowing that, like you said, maybe this was propped up for failure to begin with, but with those 20 years and now all of these people who are you know, escaping, trying to escape, uh, or having to deal with a completely different world than they grew up in. Because much like us, who grew up in a world where everything was post 9-11 you know, for most of our adulthood, that goes for the same. And then for all of the kids, 20 years of kids who never knew any different. And I think that's hard. I mean, I think that is hard uh, for the US to, to figure out how to become that leader again when we've left such a mess for people who really were relying on us. It, it, is, it is a hard reality uh, to accept. And unless people are going to advocate for the United States government, American taxpayers, and the US military to go and, uh, you know, occupy and run governments, essentially prop up governments in every country around the world where people are facing hardship and are facing suffering or persecution, then the reality is that we cannot be in that position. And as much as we want to be able to help people, as I've said, uh, ultimately those efforts inevitably end up in creating more suffering and hardship. Only the Afghan people can determine the future uh, of their country. Uh, this is, this is uh, it's tough. It's a tough conversation yep. to have as much as we want to be able to help people. Uh, but we can't be the world's police. Uh, we can't go around and, and do what we've done, especially given the, the record that we have. Yeah. And people are turning to uh, people like yourself and to current members of Congress and of the Senate to say, who do we hold accountable for this? Do we hold anyone accountable for this? For 20 years, or you could say plus, of this sort of situation happening over and over, like you said, it feels like on repeat. Do, is there any sort of repercussion and who do you hold accountable when you've had, like you said, Republican and Democrat administrations for the last 20 years uh, handling this? You know, ultimately it's about the American people holding uh, our political leaders accountable, first of all. I mean, that that is the point of a democracy when it works is that we as voters have the ability to hold those leaders accountable for the decisions that they've made that have ultimately been counterproductive in undermining the interests of the American people, our country, uh, and our national security, which is why it's so important to, to talk about the truth, uh, to expose the consequences of, of the, these policy decisions that have been made. Uh, again, whether it's a Democrat or Republican administration, this, this goes above party politics. This is really about the impacts on our country uh, and, and the American people. Yep. And you were serving, I wanted to bring this up uh, as we move to the next step of, of this conversation. When we reached out to you originally, to we've been doing this uh, shoot for about the last month, month and a half, 
yeah, we got some, yes, we'd like to do it. We'll work on the schedule. We'll try to figure it out. We're like, okay, well, hopefully this works out. And look, we reached out to Republicans, we reached out to Democrats. I have to say you're one of the few Democrats that, uh, that, that came on and said, yes, I'm in. And we appreciate that because I, I wanted to hear from multiple different points of view. Not everyone has, there's not one interview I've done in this where everyone agrees or everyone has the same version of how this story should go. But for you, you know, we found out just a few weeks ago, you were actually in, in Africa serving uh, a mission essentially against Al Qaeda. And we, we've heard about Al Qaeda and Al Qaeda this, through this last month as for Afghanistan, we don't have to worry about them anymore. That's one of the reasons we left, no problem. Uh, but they haven't gone away. Maybe they've, they're currently maybe not occupying Afghanistan. We don't know exactly the situation. But what should we know about those terror threats that are worldwide as someone who was on the ground dealing with this you know, days ago? Uh, what we need to know is, is the truth, which is that this Islamist jihadist threat that is posed to us, the American people, our country, coming from terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS, uh, they're very much alive and well and thriving. You know, this is something we need to keep an eye on in Afghanistan and be prepared to go in very quickly and immediately to try to eliminate these groups should they start to grow, should they start to get a stronghold there. But we also need to understand the truth and the reality that this is not just an issue related to Afghanistan. I think that's important to point out because you hear a lot of talking heads on TV talking solely about Afghanistan as it relates to this terrorist jihadist threat. But in reality, we've got to look at how and where uh, this threat is posed to us around the world. As you said, I, I just got back from uh, an active duty tour and a deployment um, to uh, the Horn of Africa. And uh, we see how these Islamist terrorist groups and their affiliated groups, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, we see other groups in West Africa, in countries like Mali, Niger, and Chad, and others uh, who, are, who are very strong, who are growing, and who are very active, and whose goal is to establish uh, an Islamic caliphate, Islamic uh, a governance, fueled by this Islamist ideology, Islamist ideology as distinct and different, not the same as the religion of Islam, but it's this political Islamist ideology that's fueling these jihadist groups uh, that really does pose a great threat. And and also is the thing, and I want to point out, is the thing that um, really has never been challenged. When I say in order to defeat this jihadist threat, we have to defeat them militarily and ideologically. And there really has never been an effort on the ideological front to defeat uh, this threat. And what do you mean by that? I'm just curious, the ideological front, what, what does that mean for our viewers? Well, when you look at, you look at um, the ideology that's fueling these terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS, uh, it is this exclusivist ideology and it is a political ideology that basically says, hey, if, if you uh, do not adhere to our ideology, then you must be killed uh, or converted or put into, uh, you know, indentured servitude, slavery, essentially. Uh, and, and we've seen how this political Islamist ideology, again, is distinct, not the same as, as the religion of Islam, but we've seen how terrorist groups like ISIS have put this into practice when they have created their systems of governance. Uh, we saw this in Somalia, where we were working directly with the Somali government, the Somali military, towards that shared objective of defeating this Islamist jihadist threat. There, it's it, Al-Shabaab is a very strong and thriving Al-Qaeda affiliate, and we see how there in Somalia, they have their own Islamist uh, system of governance that they are trying to use as they seek to uh, create this, this Islamist caliphate. So, so when we look at this threat, it's important that we look at it uh, in a comprehensive manner so that we can best understand how to defeat it. Is that the future, do you think, of what we've grown up as the war, the war on terror? I know it's a loaded term, the war on terror. We specifically think about Iraq and Afghanistan, but for the future on what, of what that means, is it to uh, fight this ideological war? I think it's important to point out that when we look at Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, what has what played out over the last 20 years wasn't really a war on, uh, you know, is Islamist jihadist groups like Al Qaeda and ISIS. As I said, this this became a regime change war. It became a nation building. Let's build a mini America here and there mission, which really took us away from yeah. 
that focus on that mission that should have been there after uh, after 9-11. And, and the reality is uh, that mission cannot end because these Islamist jihadist terrorists are still waging war against us. That hasn't stopped. That threat continues to grow. And when you listen to their rhetoric, when you look at their very publicly stated objectives, it's no secret what they're continuing to try to accomplish. I think people have uh, enjoyed your refreshing take on a lot of this. I think you represent a lot of people who are watching who uh, don't necessarily fit exclusively into, like you said, the party politics side of it. When, when you know, we, I see just as many people posting positive things about you from the conservative leaders to the more liberal leaders. Do you think that's what the American people, as they deal with this situation at hand, and that there is this, like you said, this global war uh, potentially happening on with jihadist terrorists, that they just want to, that they crave honesty, that they crave people who are going to speak their mind and say what they actually feel and aren't bowing down to a specific, I mean, you ran against President Trump. You were out there trying to uh, become the Democratic nominee. This is not someone who, you know, a lot of our people have come on here and by the end of this, they're doing a, a political speech for, you know, their specific party of choice. But I think a lot of people listen to you and you've been able to bridge that gap because they know you're being honest with them. They're at least, you're at least being honest in the way you believe. And in I think, and I'm curious your thoughts, if that's what people really want now, that's what our generation will grow up needing from our political leaders, which are people to just go out and be honest and say, this is how I believe, regardless if it lines up with exactly the party platform. Yes, <laughs> yes. When you look at, at the, the levels of distrust that the American people have with our government and our leadership, uh, you can see the result of year after year after year in so many different aspects of our lives and policies, how we have been lied to. And we know it, uh, you know, whether it's lies related to Afghanistan, for example, over the last 20 years, again, the Afghanistan papers revealed how much the American people have been lied to. We see how President Biden talking to President Ghani saying, hey, why don't you paint a rosier picture about what's going on there and don't really tell people how bad it is. We saw lies related to the war in Iraq with weapons of mass destruction, selling this story to the American people and to the world in order to uh, try to gain approval to go in and topple a secular dictator. We saw lies coming from Dr. Fauci related to, you know, in the very beginning of the pandemic about, hey, no, masks don't work, right. masks don't work. And then later on down the line saying, well, actually, you know, they, they really did, yeah. but we just didn't want you to know it so that we could save masks for for doctors. And so, you know, it, there's, there's, we saw how James Clapper, the, the then head of the DNI, sat before the U.S. Senate and lied to the Senate and the American people under oath about our government spying on the American people, essentially. So there are so many examples that we can point to of how we, the American people, have been lied to, the distrust that comes from that, and the hunger, the desire, the sincere desire to be able to have faith in leaders who respect the American people enough to tell them the truth, whether that truth is a hard truth and it's a truth that they may not want to hear, but respect them enough to tell them the truth because that is what is in uh, the best interest of our country. And only then can we begin to regain trust that our government's sole purpose and mission is serving the American people. I 100% agree. I think this is a, a different time and we have to have different leaders who are going to represent exactly what you said, which is just to be truthful and be honest, because again, we have felt like the, the, for our entire adulthood that we've had these uh, you know, major lies being presented to us. And look, a lot of us kind of want to be good and we want to be helpful. We want to be supportive of our military, supportive of the, the, the entire government and be you know, out there as cheerleaders for America, but it becomes harder and harder the more these things become exposed. Knowing what we know now, in hindsight being 2020, you, know, you obviously served in the war on terror and being involved in Iraq and being involved uh, in the Middle East and in Africa now. But those first few years that we know, the formative years of the war on terror, do you think that this war was worth it now looking back on it, knowing that now that, you know, it was at the Iwo Jima statue a few weeks ago and you know, they're about to emblazon the end date. You know, they're about to put that 2021 end date on the war on terror. Do you think it was worth it? Well, it's not over. Speaking of telling the truth, it's not over. That's, that's a fact and a reality that we have to face just because we hear politicians on television saying, hey, the war is over, the war is over. Well, the enemy gets a say in that. 
and the reality that we that that we know to be true and i know this firsthand having just returned from uh, a deployment to africa where we have uh, service members working with partner nations and partner military forces solely focused on this mission of defeating this islamist jihadist terrorist threat so the war isn't over uh, and we must continue to stay focused so long as the enemy is waging that war on defeating them militarily uh, and ideologically. We have to understand that we take action based on what's in the best interest of the American people and the security of our country. And our leaders need to remember that and stay focused on it. I want to say how much I appreciate you spending time with us today and talking uh, about not just Afghanistan, but the entire your entire experience in the war on terror. I wrap up every interview this way, and I just want to get your thoughts as someone who obviously was a major part in this and who was involved, and I'm sure have dealt with families and families yourself of fallen military and veterans who are now looking at a disaster of the last few months. And are deeply concerned and are deeply depressed. And you've heard from a, a lot of, I, I know personally, families that have gone through a lot of, of issues the last month. And a lot of them are saying, was this worth it? Did their family die in vain? And we at least can look back and say, look, even if the, the overall mission maybe was one that was not a winnable one, there was 20 years there of good. And there was military people who were out there serving and, and people that were serving in Afghanistan, uh, whether that was people who lived there or our own uh, Americans, they were doing a lot of good things. I don't want I don't want them to be forgotten in all of this. They will never be forgotten. We cannot forget the sacrifices uh, that they have made. And there is no decision that any politician can make that takes anything away from that most powerful uh, act of sacrifice uh, taken in in love for our country and in service to the American people. Uh, many of my brothers and sisters in uniform have sacrificed greatly, too many paying the ultimate price, leaving their families behind, never having a chance to say their final goodbye. Uh, we hold them in the highest regard and do our best to continue to honor their sacrifice uh, with, with our lives. Um, that act of selflessness, that act of service, the ultimate act of putting service above self um, will will never be forgotten, and no politician's decision will ever do anything to detract away from uh, from that. Thank you for your service, your continued service to this country, and for being uh, being at least honest with us, which is very refreshing and nice. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Logan. Thanks. Aloha.